Hey guys, we have Houston's very own Robert Flores from MLB Network. That's right, talking to us about the 2022 Astros baseball season. It's the opening day special of Locked on Astros, and who better to have than Roflo himself? Who will compete for MVP from the Astros? Does Jordan break the 40 home run plateau this year, and will the Astros return to the Fall Classic? His thoughts on MLB The Show 22, and how will Roflo do in the pressure cooker? Let's go. Welcome to Locked On Astros, your daily Astros podcast. Here are your hosts, Eric the Man Heisman and Brett H Town Wheelhouse Chancy. We are Locked On Houston Astros, and we hope that you join us for a daily Locked On Astros podcast. My name is Eric Heisman. You can find me on Twitter at Eric Talk Astros. Find the show at Locked On Astros, your team every day. Brett, where can where can they find you at? They can find me at H Town Wheelhouse on Twitter and Instagram, and at Astros four one one on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Always positive. Opening days right around the corner. Always Astros. Alrighty, thank you for making the Locked On Astros podcast your first listen. Because y'all make us your first listen, we're, we're able to get great guests like the one we have right below us, right down here. That's Robert Flores from MLB Network. So where can they find you at, Robert? Hey, right there where that little, right there. You can find <laughs> me on, on Twitter at RealFlow, and then you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash RealRealFlow. Yeah, so, you know, Robert, we wanted to tell the people at MLB Network TV program that you are a part of every day starts yeah. at 8 a.m. Houston time this week right. on Thursday. And then it's Monday through Friday, every Thursday, 8 a.m. at a new time, MLB Network. You'll check Robert Flores. You will find um, D Row, all the great um, you know commentators you guys have, and all the great coverage. Yeah, it's uh, it's myself, it's Lauren, it's D Row, and uh, we're back for another season starting on opening day. And as you mentioned, it's a brand new time. We are on at 8 a.m. Central Time. In the past, we've been on at 9 a.m. Central Time, but this year we're starting an hour early, still going till noon Central Time, uh, but we can't wait to get started. All right. I know it's a new cast of characters for the Houston Astros, but then again, it's a lot of the same people. You got Justin Verlander coming back. Carlos Correa is gone. Uh, you've got a lot of the core still here. You got Hector Neris um, coming in a bullpen. Uh, what are your over, overall thoughts of the Astros team before we get in, get into the lineup and the rotation and the bullpen? Yeah, I, I think they're still the best team in that division. Uh, the Seattle Mariners made some strides last year, and they obviously have some big-time expectations. They have a very solid young core of their own. Um, and, and they so they also added Robbie Ray. So they're going to be better. I think the Angels will be better. They're still searching for pitching. Uh, the health of Mike Trout, the health of Shohei Otani. Um that th that's always supremely important to have two healthy superstars and trout and Otani at various times here recently have struggled in that department. So they're hoping that they will be back. I think the Texas Rangers are going to be better as well. Um, I, I don't see them challenging for a playoff spot just yet, but they're going to be significantly better. Corey Seager, Marcus Simeon down the road. I think Jack Leiter is going to be an, an ace, a front of the rotation, potential Cy Young winner. I would seriously doubt that we see him in the big leagues in 2022, but it won't be soon Soon after. It won't be too much longer before we do see him. So just about every team in that division is better, but I still think the Astros are the best team in it. So this team loses a third star three years in a row where we have Springer gone, Cole gone, and yeah. Correa gone. And probably Correa out of those three, you know, you hate to compare him to Springer, <laughs> exactly. But Correa was a heart and soul in 2020. He took on the mantra of the team. He took on the playoffs. He took on the yeah. brunt of this team when they got into the controversy and they were, they were swirled in all this hatred. And Carlos was like, come at us. And he became H town. He wore the H town versus everyone shirt. A team like this, are the Astros one of the teams that's built to withstand yet another superstar exiting Houston? I mean, I don't know. I guess we're going to find out. Um, there's a couple of things that, um, look, here's what concerns me. Let's get into what concerns me about the 2022 Astros up the middle. 
You want to be strong up the middle. Martin Maldonado, one of the best defensive catchers in all of baseball. That's, you know, he calls a game great. Pitchers love throwing to him. That's fine. Jeremy Pena, you need to be strong up the middle. Your shortstop has to be good. Uh, Jeremy Pena is not going to be Carlos Correa. And he doesn't need to be Carlos Correa. Jeremy Pena needs to make most of the routine plays and occasionally make some superstar plays. That's it. And if he can hit a little bit, great. Uh, center field, Chaz McCormick, Jake Myers is going to start on the injured list. That's the spot that concerned me last year, and it concerns me even more this year. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, yeah, there's a lot of ifs uh, kind of really at the shortstop spot and like center field, like you said. But Jeremy Pena has shown a little bit. That, I mean, I know he showed, he showed some pop at the end, but uh, with a championship team, you're going to have to rely on prospects. But I know – kind of the thought process of most teams is you don't want to have to rely on them opening day, but yeah. I think the Astros just, they, they didn't want to kind of put all their money in the Carlos Correa basket because they eventually they're going to have to pay Alvarez. They're going to have to pay Tucker. They're going to have to pay maybe even Altuve to extend them even further. Maybe Bregman, depending on what's going on with him. So right. do you think that overall the Astros made the good decision at not paying Correa? Um, that's tough to answer because that's not my money, right. right? Um, I'm not in on their budgetary. I don't have their spreadsheets in front of me, but my opinion, no, I, I didn't understand why you wouldn't, uh, have one more year of prime Carlos Correa. Give him, give him, give him $35.1 million and let him have his opt out. If he uses it, that means that he had a great season. That usually means you've won a lot of games. So I, I didn't understand if you don't want to give him a long-term contract, that's fine. I understand that. That seems to be the uh, organizational policy. And so right. far, who, who could argue with that, that logic? They've been very successful with it. But I just didn't understand why, I mean, according to reports, I know for a fact that they didn't engage Carlos or his representatives at all post lockout. I, I didn't, I don't understand that. I will never understand that. But again, I don't have maybe, you know, I, we, we don't have all the pertinent information. They obviously know infinitely more about their current state of the budget than we do. But I just didn't understand why you wouldn't have another year of Carlos Correa, give him his opt out because if he uses it, like I said, that usually means both parties have uh, won a lot of games. And that's what I think a lot of Astros fans were questioning, were concerned about. Mm -hmm. Because Carlos Correa is one of these guys that you would think, okay, he, you could build a statue for this guy one day in this city. Um, yeah. He could be one of the greats. Now, there was an article that came out um, that I believe that Jose Altuve is now being mentioned because he's one of the – longest standing guys here as probably the third greatest Astro of all time behind Bijou and Bagwell. And he said, I don't want to go anywhere else. And I think fans take him at his word. Yeah. He's a guy that I think you would almost have to pry off of this team. Um, you're not going to see a late season Jose Altuve or a late career Jose Altuve go somewhere else because he loves this city. How big is it though, to still have Jose Altuve and with the focus he has going into the season that he wants to hit for contact and yeah. average and not necessarily power. Yeah, no, look, um, just because Carlos Correa left, uh, and, and let make no mistake, th this is a cornerstone franchise player that they just let walk out the door. Uh, you mentioned uh, George Springer leaving and obviously a supremely talented player has won a lot of games, has been great in this league. But I think Carlos Correa is, is even a little bit a notch above. And that's no disrespect to George Springer. Uh, that being said, uh, th the cupboard is not bare. Uh, you mentioned Altuve. Bregman, I think, is an X factor. And, and Kyle Tucker and Jordan Alvarez – and Michael Brantley and Yuli Gurriel, that clubhouse has won a lot of games. There are a lot of talented dudes still left behind. 
But I just go back to my main point. I don't understand why you wouldn't want another have why you wouldn't want to have one more year of Carlos Correa in his prime. I don't understand it. Well, uh, I guess when you have a star shortstop uh, in the minor league system, then maybe you can afford to let somebody like that go. And so maybe yeah. that's what the Astros were thinking. And speaking of prospects, why don't you check out the Locked On MLB Prospects with uh, Lindsey Crosby? He does a great job over there. He covers all all teams, not just the Astros. He recently sat down with uh, Brett and uh, did a like a 30 to 40 minute just on Jeremy Pena, just giving you the ins and out of Jeremy Pena, what to expect. And yeah. we're going to ask uh, about Robert Flores, about what his thoughts of Jeremy Pena in a second. But uh, go check out the Locked On MLB Prospects with Lindsey Crosby, wherever you get your podcast, uh, Odyssey, Apple, Spotify, and uh, he does a great job. So let's go hey, ahead. Eric, re yeah, real quick. Let me, let me talk about Jeremy Pena because I – when, when I was, uh, let's see, I covered the Astros in the ALCS, uh, the games in, in, in Boston, and then covering them in the World Series in Houston. I, I noticed that Jeremy Pena, uh, it wasn't an accident that Jeremy Pena was with the Astros during their entire postseason run. He was there. He was taking BP. He was taking uh, ground balls in the outfield. He was there. Right. Obviously didn't play in the game, but he was there. And that was that was done. That, like I said, that's, that wasn't act. That wasn't an accident. They wanted him to be around the team during big games, during big moments to to I, I think to underscore and to show him this one. This is where you want to be. These are the games you want to play in. And once you get here, this is how you conduct yourself. Get used to this pressure, this the, the, the atmosphere of being in a fall classic. So Jeremy Pena, if, if you read anything you read about him, he is a very committed young man, supremely talented. Um, and sure, I'm sure he feels some pressure, but like I said before, they don't need him to be Carlos Correa. They need him to be the best version of Jeremy Pena. And whatever that looks like right now at this stage, I think that's going to be good enough. I, I think he, as I said, I'll go back to those three things. Make most of the routine plays, occasionally make spectacular plays, and hit a little bit. I think that's kind of the three-pronged attack for Jeremy Pena. If you're a fan and moving forward of what you're going to be looking for in 2022 from this youngster. I know that looking at the prospects, there's a lot of top prospects making their debut. I know Bobby mm -hmm. Witt Jr. We're talking about this pre-show. Brett, I'll let, I'll let you list all the ones in a second. But um, I, are they actually uh, – Is do you think Jeremy Pena has a chance to be able to um, like get a rookie year? So, Brett, what are the other names out there? So, for the rookie of the year, basically the top candidates this year – are Bobby Witt Jr., um, Julio Rodriguez from Seattle. You have this Suzuki coming out of, and I'm and I'm talking about both leagues. I'm just talking about top ten yeah. rookies all together. Um, Spencer Torkelson, Riley Green, um, yeah. Adley Adley Rushman. Um, you got in the National League. Joey um, Bart still a rookie. Yeah, right? yeah. Joey Bart, O'Neal Carre, um, Cruz, um, Hunter Green, Bryson Stott, who I didn't even know of until today, until I started looking at him. Jeremy Pena is in a stacked rookie field. Where yeah. do you think Jeremy Pena ranks? I, I put him at about I, I put him at 10 right now. Do you think he has a chance to move up in four through six? Ooh, I don't know what um, top three might be. Top three might be ambitious with Bobby Witt, with with Rodriguez, and with Torque. Yeah, I I, I don't see, and, and again, this is no disrespect to to right. Jeremy Pena. Um no. I, I I just see him as as a you know if you're ranking them maybe just outside the top 10 hovering around i don't know <laughs> 11 through 16 something like that but when you look at the the cream of the crop of the rookie class as we stand right now and once the games play Who that's when that guys thing? begin to exactly. separate themselves right. but if you look at Bobby Witt Jr he plays plays shortstop, although he's going to be playing third. Uh, my camera keeps going out. Uh, he he keeps he's going to be playing third. 
but he swings just like Mike Trout. It's uncanny what you know what what they can do or what he can do. Um, so I I I I think for me, Bobby Witt Jr. is probably the top rookie going into 2022 with Spencer Torkelson in that mix and then Julio Rodriguez uh, for the Seattle Mariners. Well, it's almost like if you're trying to win MVP over someone like Michael Jordan, right? I mean, it's like this field is so stacked. I mean, it's like you would have Barry, you know, Emmett Smith, Barry Sanders, Walter Payton, and you're and you're in this class yeah. with them. I mean, this is a rookie class that is strong. But I want to talk about some 2022 um, season expectations. Kyle Tucker. Um, mm-hmm. Now, Kyle Tucker in Houston are, yeah. is on top of everybody's list because of the way he ended after that first really kind of tough month. Yeah. And we know Bad what luck. he's got. Yeah. Bad luck. Do you think that Kyle Tucker has potential to put himself in the MVP talk come the end of the season? Oh, absolutely. Um, as you said, despite that horrific slow start, uh, to to 2021, he ended the season as one of the top hitters in all of baseball. And it, there's certain metrics that have him as the best hitter in baseball at the end of 2021. So I think Kyle Tucker has the chance to be an MVP. I think he has a chance to really become a, another cornerstone piece for this franchise. And and I know that they brought up the idea of a contract extension, and and he said, "Yeah, I'm I'm open to it." I don't know what those numbers would look like. Maybe you would go to the Altuve model a little bit. Um, obviously, Altuve was was an MVP before he signed his his extension. So if Kyle Tucker really wants to help himself, winning an MVP is probably a good place to start. But yeah, they need him to be what he was last season, if not more. Um, I, I go back to Alex Bregman, circling back to him. Here, here's what it is. Let, let's broad brush here. Here's two X factors for me, okay? And they're both well-known commodities. But depending on their health and depending on what they do, I think could determine a long, could go a long way in determining how good this Astros season is going to be. One, Lance McCullers. Two, Alex Bregman. Alex Bregman needs to return to his MVP level form. Agreed. They need they need that. Last season, he battled through some injuries, didn't have the power numbers that we were accustomed to. But other guys were able to cover it, namely Carlos Correa. Correa is not there anymore. Alex Bregman's going to have to be a a big, you know, hoss in the middle of that lineup. That's what they need. And Lance McCullers, when he's healthy, and we've seen that here in the past season or so, when he's healthy, he's effective. A healthy Lance McCullers, along with Justin Verlander, along with Framber Valdez and Luis Garcia and Christian Javier and Jose Arquiti with McCullers. Everyone else slots in nicely without McCullers. Then for me, it gets a little dicey. So hopefully Lance is, is on the mend and we'll see him sooner rather than later. You know, real quick before Eric brings up his next question. And I had just heard this on MLB network radio on Sirius XM that Bregman's grip on his hand that he had operated on, you know, they do the strength grip. And I think yeah. his non hurt hand was like 140. His hurt hand was like barely at a 20. I mean, he yeah. basically said that it was painful just to grip the bat. And yeah. I remember having conversations with Eric after games, like something's got to be wrong with him. Something's not right. He's like, he got that home run. I think he got like one home run late in the postseason, but that was it is because he got a hold of the ball. And so, It'll be good to have him back, um, you know. Yeah, I, I know that uh, there's actually an article in the Chronicle about uh, they did an interview with uh, with Troy Snick, Snicker, and he was saying that uh, from 2019 to uh, last year, Bregman kind of altered his swing, and uh, most of it was due to the injury. Of course, last yeah. year with the hand and then with the hamstring injury, of course, you're going to kind of t- tweak your yeah, quad, yeah. Uh, so you're going to tweak your um, your swing a little bit. So what he's trying to do is kind of get back to where he was in 2019. And if he's able to do that, then um, this lineup could be very devastating. And oh, one, of the, one of the guys that uh, we want to kind of address is I don't think we've seen the best 
from Jordan Alvarez yet. In his rookie season, he had 27 home runs. In the shortened season, he only had 87 games. Last um, last year, he had 33 home runs with 104 RBIs and 144 games. Do you think that with if he plays more time in the field, do you think that we'll see him maybe uh, eclipse to 40 home runs? Because we saw Evan Gaddis, remember, went – fluky when he played catcher he seemed to play better yeah no i i think there's also if i'm not mistaken i think that there are numbers that support jordan alvarez being more effective right. when he plays year, in yeah. the in, in the field yeah. I, I think that yeah. definitely yeah, bodes well for for the astros and, and and for jordan um i i think he has a chance to, he is so so talented he has massive massive pop. So if we, if we are, if that leads us to believe that we're going to see an even better Jordan Alvarez, then, then as an Astro fan, you have to be thinking, yeah, sign me up. I guess the, the thing that would worry me with him playing more in the field is I think he would be more susceptible to injury, but you know, look, that you, you got to put him out there. He's a, he's a finely tuned athlete. He's a big man. He still moves very well, and I, I know that some at some point during this spring he had his first baseman's mitt out there, and I, I think eventually that is where you're going to see Jordan Alvarez. Mm. I, I know that Yuli Gurriel, he's obviously getting up there in age. Eventually his time uh, with the Astros will be coming to an end, whether that means his retirement or maybe who moves on, but his time with the Astros is coming to an end sooner rather than later. Right. But I think eventually we're going to see Jordan Alvarez play first base. I, yeah. Last year as a left fielder, he batted 352 with a OPS of 1.169 with 15 home runs as a DH. He batted 251 with a 771 OPS yeah. with 18 home runs. That so is there. almost, yeah, that is almost a hundred point swing. And he's even said on more than one occasion I feel more comfortable, but and that makes sense. If you've ever played even even baseball, little league, if you're the EH or if you're the kid that's been sitting all game and you got to come in and pitch and it's the it's the other team's best pitcher as a closer, like those at bats don't usually go well. And I think he's even further removed from the knee surgery. I think he's still young. And the other day when he slid in West Palm for that foul ball, first my first question was, <gasps> you weren't on your grounded. You can't do that in spring training. You got to let it drop. It's practice, right? I mean, come on. Let's let's take the Allen Iverson approach. But he got up and he popped up and he's doing that. And he needs to do that because you can't just act like you're walking on eggshells. I mean, eventually, this is a professional athlete. And he, I mean, guys, we got him for Josh Fields. Like this still blows my mind. Thank yeah. you, no, LA it, Dodgers. Thank you. It, it's definitely a trade that has worked out, and I know that um, who uh, Jay in the chat brings up a good point. Dusty will use the DH as a spot to rest some of the regulars. So mm -hmm. if you're able to put your Don out in the field for an extended period of time, that allows Michael Brantley to get off his feet. I think he probably is at this stage of his career a little bit more accustomed, maybe a little bit more comfortable to being a DH only, but he can also be in the field if necessary. I don't know what happens if when Kyle Tucker DHs or when Kyle Tucker needs a day off. I, I think those are kind of those are the interesting things that we're gonna have to see how it how it plays out to see how Dusty decides to handle that. You know, it'd been a better trade, uh, Alvarez for a box of built bars. That would have been better. So, Brett, tell us a little bit about dynamite segue, Eric. Dynamite <laughs> segue. Built bar is the best tasting protein bar in the land. And I just ordered these things, they're called built peeps. It's basically a built puff, but it tastes like the peeps that you get. For the Easter season. So like I am blown away. Like not only am I excited about opening day this week, but I'm excited about Built Bar. Built Bar is wrapped in 100% chocolate. It's healthy for you. And Robert, I've got to get your info offline, maybe your business address. I'm going to send you some Built Bars, okay? I'm going to yeah, send you I'm, some I like, I as like a anything, gift to you. Like I will send you and I want you to taste it. So next time you come on the show, you can tell everybody how 
this built bar that averages 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and 17 grams of protein got you through the day and got you ready for the show, got you ready to go on the air and just kick butt like you always do. Yeah, Not I'm, only that, I'm a sucker for a good for a good protein bar, so absolutely. And, and they have built puffs. If you like marshmallows, dude, they have churro. They have cinnamon churro as a flavor. And being excuse from Houston, me, sir. Yes, cinnamon <laughs> churro built puff. I'm telling you, it's okay. to die for. They have right. banana cream pie, and this is how this is what you do. You go to built.com and use the promo code LOCKS15 for 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKS15 for 50% off at built.com. It's the best bar in the biz. And once Roflo gets a hold of them, <laughs> it's over. Yeah, those things are going to be gone quickly. Robert's like this. <laughs> Let me write this down. Exactly. What's up, World Traveler? How you doing, man? <laughs> All righty. So, uh, yeah, definitely uh, get yourself a built bar. And, uh, yeah, it's great to have Robert Flores back on here. And we're, we love having you on here and uh, hearing your, your views on the Astros. And so – um, definitely, I want to go ahead and kind of talk. You, you kind of mentioned Lance McCullers earlier, um, that he's kind of key to the season. I, I want to kind of talk about that a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about what your expectations about Verlander is. But how yeah. long do you see uh, McCullers being out? That's a really yeah. good question. They're obviously going to be very cautious. Um, you know, one of the byproducts of the, of the lockout is that the players were not able to speak with not just managers and general managers, but training staff, team doctors, as I mentioned, training staff that helps them formulate a plan to, to rehab injuries. So I, I think that also played a role in, in, in what Lance is currently dealing with. I, I don't know. I have not heard on when, when they expect him back. I think it would be, I, I don't think we see him before, just pure speculation, my gut call, not till mid-May at the earliest. But here is where the Astros are lucky enough to have some depth in, in the rotation. You guys got, as at the top, you got obviously Verlander, and then you got Fromber and Garcia and Urquidy and Odorizzi and Javier. So they do have some choices there. And what also helps them, if you look at the schedule, there are some, some depth some off days. So where they can shorten that rotation even more without putting stress on anyone else. Now, once it, I, I think it's in May or in June, they have a brutal, brutal stretch. Hopefully by then Lance's McCull Lance McCullers is back because as I said, I really think that he is one of the two X factors in, determ in determining how far this Astros team can go. So uh, what about Justin Verlander? Do you see them limiting him to X amount of innings? Do you yeah. see them limiting him to five per star to try to save him for October? Yeah, they're going to be very, very cautious. Clearly he is. It's two things. One, he's coming off Tommy John surgery. And two, he's older. So those are two things that they have to consider. And no doubt that they are. But I think what you, you have to be very, very encouraged from what you've seen so far in spring, the velocity looks like it's it's about what we would expect from a healthy Justin Verlander. But make no mistake, they are going to be very cautious. And here's the other thing. That's not just exclusive to Justin Verlander. This is going to be a plan that all teams, no matter what their pitchers what their current state of health is, whether they're coming off Tommy John or perfectly healthy because of a shortened spring training teams are going to be very, very cautious and judicious with how they use their starting pitchers. So that's why they have the expanded rosters for the first part of the season. I imagine you'll see most teams like the Astros lengthening that bullpen. So they have as many arms as possible. Um, so the, the, the Astros are going to be no doubt very cautious with how they use Justin Verlander moving forward. So let's do this. I know you're a gamer. I know you're into MLB The Show. MLB yeah. The Show 22 came out with Shohei Otani as yeah. the cover. I know Ben Verlander has been pumping that thing up. He He's like a kid in a candy store with this. But I know you're a pretty competitive gamer. What yeah. is your impression? What do you like most about the new game? I, I You know, I love the game. Uh, first of all, and just about every year I'm, I'm there for it. And I think it's a great game, but in this year's game, the, the, the ability to team up with either one of your friends 
or two of your friends and take on another team 2v2 or 3v3. I, I think that that's such a unique feature and I, it's a lot of fun. We I've, I've already tried it out a couple of times. It's a lot of fun. Friendships will be tested, no doubt, because <laughs> As I said, you're you're not just hitting all the time. Your friend, your your buddy's hitting as well. So I, I think it's a really cool mode and, and definitely something that uh, uh, makes the game uh, even more fun to play. Now, have you pulled any 99 rated players? Have you gotten any studs yet? No, not yet. I mean, I'm, yet. I'm, I'm trying to hold off. I'm trying to. Uh, I mean, you know, you know Verlander's trying already... not to fire up the credit card as, as <laughs> much as possible, but man, it sure is tempting. Well, you know, Verlander already pulled a 99 Otani, and then he already pulled Justin. I'm like thinking, I'm like, I'm like, he's got an end with somebody there at San Diego Studios. But this is what we want to do. We want to put you in the pressure cooker. Okay. And we want to ask you some questions that might be a little tough. So if the heat gets too hot, just let us know. Um, the first question is this. I'll ask this, and I'll have Eric ask the second question. Okay. What happens first? Kyle Tucker MVP – or the Astros win another World Series? Ooh. It's a really good question. Seems like Man. it's too hot. Yeah. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go Kyle Tucker wins another MVP. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good deal. But with the caveat, with the caveat During that if World he wins I was about to say, if he if he wins MVP. Then more than likely the Astros are making a deep run in the postseason. Nice, nice. All right. Who will have a greater impact on the team 10 years from now? Alex Santos or Hunter Brown? I'll go Hunter Brown. I think we might see Hunter Brown maybe as soon as as this year, you, you know. So uh give give me Hunter Brown. Okay. Hey, awesome. let me do the next one because okay. I, I've always made fun of this guy. So, and it's nothing against him, just a fantasy baseball thing. I'll tell you about it no. later, but who is a better shortstop Craig Reynolds or Adam Everett? Ooh, give me Craig Reynolds. I loved Adam Everett. <laughs> great glove. Great defensively, but not the biggest offensive threat, shall we say? <laughs> I, I think I think Craig Reynolds might still hold the record for most triples, the team record for most triples in a season. I, I think I think so. Evan but Gaddis if, didn't break it. Oh wait, maybe you're right. Maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, I don't maybe know. you're right. And, and, and Jay brings up a, a great name if we're talking about great Astro shortstops. One of my all-time favorite Astros from back in the day, Dickie Thon. Yeah, the only reason yeah. I brought up um, uh, Adam Everett is because whenever we do fantasy draft, everybody asks, well, who are you picking, Eric? I'm like, oh, I'm definitely going Adam Everett. <laughs> <It's a good laughs> <day. laughs> so so let me ask you this, because we addressed this earlier um, about Jose Altuve saying that he wanted to stay here. Who is more likely to play their entire career in a Houston Astros uniform, Jose Altuve or Alex Bregman? I knew that I knew that was going to be the question. <laughs> Help me out here. What's the difference in their ages? I know Altuve is older. I believe, yeah, Bregman came in what 2015, right? Or tw no, 20. I'm gonna look it up right now. 2016, I believe. Um, because I think he okay, was so Jose a, Altuve is he came in 2011. He's 31. He's 31. And, and Alex then, Bregman is 28. <sighs> I'll say Altuve just because I think, I mean, Bregman is going to still have another bite at the apple as far as free agency goes. So since he's younger, I'll, I'll go Altuve. Uh, all right. I'm going to throw one in there that wasn't in there. What's Who's the next Astros starter to win 20 games? Ooh, wow. Well, the way the pitching is used today, yeah. I, I think it makes it very difficult to have 20 game winners. I, I, I don't know if, man. <laughs> too hot? <laughs> it, I think it's too hot. Get You know what? I, I don't think it happens this year, but how about, you know what, Justin Verlander. Maybe it doesn't happen this year. Maybe it happens next year. So there we go. 
And hey, look at that. Um, you know, our guy Johnny Munoz from the Rio Grande Valley says Robert Flores has the best hair that I've seen <laughs> since Jimmy Johnson. And hey, I have much better hair than Jimmy Johnson. Have you seen all that spray that uh, Jimmy Johnson used? I think oh, that yeah. thing is like uh, sh shellacked on there. This is uh, this is just a little little bit of product product and a little bit of blow drying. So definitely it is better. definitely. So, you know, thank you, Robert, so much for coming on. Like we really appreciate you. I know our listeners, our viewers appreciate you coming on. Not only are you, are we proud that you are from Houston, go Cougs, Cougs house. I was really hoping the Cougars would, would make a yeah, push for a title. I know, but, but hey, you know, next what, year they're going to be really that's good. That's right. They're going to be, but really you know, good. Calvin Sampson, he has really built, he's really making a bid to be the greatest basketball coach at U of H. I mean, I know that's, that's a lot. It's a tall order. Well, yeah, listen, Guy, Guy V. Lewis is still the benchmark right. when it comes to coaching at, at the University of Houston. But what Kellen Sampson has, uh, you know, what Kelvin Sampson has done at, at the University of Houston, that program, it, it, it wasn't dead, but it was on life support. And what, what he has done with that program and the atmosphere and the facilities now, uh, the recruiting, I, I saw one preseason poll that had University of Houston for next year, ranked number two. Um, I, I'm just hoping Marcus Sasser comes back. But uh, no, it, it's, it's definitely amazing what, what he and really his family, because remember his son is on the staff and, and I believe his daughter is also uh, involved in basketball ops. So she is heavily involved there. So it's, it's a really... It's a family effort and a family affair for for University of Houston basketball, and it's certainly been a lot of fun. All right, um, we haven't even asked you the big question yet: How many wins are the Astros going to get this year? And how far are they going to go? Let's add yes. that. Hi, that's tough. All right, this will make people angry. I have them right. I have them <laughs> losing in the. ALCS to the White Sox. Wow. How about that? How Interesting. About that? Now, do you have them winning at least 93 games? I'll put them at, yeah, roughly around there. I was going to say 91, 92, but 93 sounds fine. Um, like I said, the division is, is improved. But I still think that they're the best team in the division. And the Mariners, look, they're going to have a lot of, they're, they're maybe a, a Vogue, sexy playoff team pick. I will say one thing that concerns me about the Mariners is they had a negative run differential last year and won a lot of games. That's difficult to do two years in a row. That's difficult to replicate. Getting outscored for an entire season and still being in the mix basically till the final day for a playoff spot. That is very difficult to do. I don't think that they can do that again. So they're going to have to be improved uh, in, in a variety of ways as my uh, camera goes out again. So um, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see what, what happens with, uh, with, with, with the Mariners, but make no mistake, the whole, the whole division is better, but I still think ultimately the Astros will, will reign supreme again. All right. We had some questions earlier in the podcast. I kind of want to get to it as we close out the podcast. Yeah. Um, what do you think, is the end result of this whole Yankees letter? What do you think is the outcome? Do you think anything comes from it? No, nothing's going to come from it. Um, Yankee fans are going to think the way they think and won't be convinced otherwise. And the same goes for Astro fans. Uh, I, I, I like Chris Sale's comments earlier this week, which basically was like, for everyone accusing the Astros of doing what they did. First of all, they probably, and this is Chris Sale's words. First of all, they probably weren't the only ones doing it. And two, you better make sure your own house is clean before you're accusing others. So I don't think anything earth shattering. I know Astro fans are on the edge of their seat and they're waiting and they're, Oh, open that letter. The letter is going to be open. We're going to know it and nothing's going to change. People are still going to hate the Astros. Astro fans are going to feel a certain way. Yankee fans are going to feel a certain way. And nothing's going to change. No one's mind is going to change. Because after all, this is 2022. And that's kind of the way we roll as a country anyway. So, Definitely. 
Yeah, I, I know Johnny asked about the anti sign stealing. Yeah. Devices. Do you think a lot of pitch, pitchers and catchers are going to use it, or do you think it's going to be? I think something? it's going to be. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see how many teams and pitchers and catchers use it. The ones that did use it this spring, from what I've read, they all seem to really like it. So if it can prevent sign stealing, whether it be through conventional or more nefarious ways. I, I never, I don't have a pro, I don't think anyone has a problem with if a guy's, if guys are watching the game from a dugout and they see a pitcher doing something every time he throws a fastball, yeah. that's fair game. But obviously what, what was going on a few years ago, uh, that was, <laughs> was so, that was so far, so far out of bounds. So if, if this device can, prevent those more nefarious ways from being used. I'm all for it. And I think it might also speed up the game a little bit. No more having to come out to the mound where both guys have their gloves over their face and, and talking, <laughs> you know, let, let's just, let's just speed it up. Let's get the pitch, get the location and let's move on. Yeah. Carl's Beltran came out and said that uh, other teams were doing it. So we had to do it in Houston. And if somebody told us to stop doing it, yeah. we would have stopped doing it. And yeah, the world series in Houston is tainted as he was hired by the yes network, but we don't have time <laughs> to talk about all that, but it's just hilarious. Yeah. All the comments. So, yeah. Right. Well, hey, you know, thanks again. We do appreciate it. We will be watching. It. We'll be watching you on um, MLB Network, and we definitely want to have you back. If you're ever in Houston for a game, let us know. Let's hook up. Let's get together, and um, let's do this whole baseball thing together. And just tell Roflo and everybody we say. I mean, tell 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 Dero and everybody I said hello, and that Eric says hi, and that we're big fans of the show. You got it. And uh, myself and Dero and Lauren, we're back on Thursday. Remember, new time, 8 a.m. Houston time, MLB Central on MLB Network. All right. That's all we got for this edition of the Locked on Astros podcast. Make sure you check us out Monday through Friday. We don't have a set time, especially with the game starting. We're going to be late nights, especially after these um, late night games in Anaheim and all that. So, uh, check us out and Ghost Rose's opening day is um, Thursday. That's I uh, can't wait. Season's almost here, so we'll see what uh, Framer Valdez, the new opening day pitcher, will do. Uh, thank Thanks you for again, having me, Robert. guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.